go to the elections office and get that figured out because we can't get it before then. So vote, civic engagement, yay. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you guys. And um, yes. I strongly encourage you to just put them in the mail. And don't wait to the last minute to do it. Put it in the mail now. Get it out of the way. That's what I've done. And um, then it's uh, a uh, simple matter. Okay. So that's the last we will hear of the election. So uh, I appreciate your attention on that. And I thank our visitors for coming. We turn our attention from election matters to membranes. And we're still in membranes, and we're going to be in membranes for a little while. Even after we finish this lecture on lipids and membranes, we'll be talking about membrane transport in the mitochondria later today. Um, I hope what you've seen so far from what I've talked about with uh, transport systems is that transport systems, A, use a variety of energy sources, and B, because they are transporting things usually against a concentration gradient, that is most transport systems are active transport systems, that they create unusual circumstances. And so cells, you've seen one example where cells use those unusual circumstances to accomplish something. So you saw the sodium gradient, for example, could be used to pump calcium out of heart cells. Okay. We're going to see other uh, manifestations of that, and one of the most common of those uh, is what occurs in nerve cells. Nerve cells um, uh, rely on the fact that, just like every other cell in the body, they um, have pumped out of them uh, excess sodium, and they have pumped into them excess potassium. Okay? So why is that important? Well, it turns out that what happens during signaling in nerve cells is that those gradients are disturbed. And since the gradients are pretty steep, if you poke a hole, or you literally don't poke a hole, but you actually open up something that allows those ions to move, you will change the potential of the nerve cell tremendously. The potential being, of course, the voltage. All right. So uh, when we look at neural transmission, what we see um, is something that happens um, like this. But here's the membrane um, um, uh, 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 being disturbed, uh, the ions moving across, and we eventually get um, a, uh, a big change of ions across there and things come back to rest. And I'm going to explain to you how that happens uh, today. So imagine that I'm a nerve cell that is in the end of my finger. And I take my finger and I stick it into a flame. Not a very smart thing, but I'm not a very smart guy. Okay? Well, what's going to happen? Well, before I destroy everything in my finger, my nerves are going to tell me that wasn't the smartest thing to do and try to get my finger out of the fire. All right? Well, how do they do that? The way that they do that is um, a, a very simple mechanism, surprisingly. The surprisingly simple mechanism is that the very first thing that happens in neural transmission is that the sodium gate, we have uh, nerve cells that have gates. And these gates allow selected ions to move across them, and only those selected ions. So the first thing that happens when a nerve cell is stimulated, and we have different kinds of nerve cells, some that respond to touch, some that respond to temperature, some that respond to, um, uh, in our mouth, taste, or things like that, a light in our eyes, etc. It doesn't matter, but the first thing that happens in this nerve cell in my finger is that the sodium gates open. Okay? This happens almost instantaneously. And when the sodium gates open, remember we've got excess sodium outside the cell compared to inside the cell. The first thing that happens is sodium rushes in. This causes a voltage change because we're moving an ion across the membrane. Right? The voltage changes drastically, okay? and when the voltage changes, okay, we've started the process of transmitting that information, the information being that this nerve cell is signaling something's going on. Okay? Now ultimately, the nerve cells tie into your spinal cord and or your brain, and uh, th those messages are interpreted. Okay? So we're not going to be dealing with the interpretation of the messages. We're only going to be dealing with the sending of the messages. Okay? So the sending of the messages starts with the opening of the sodium gates. Well, sodium comes rushing in. And when it comes rushing in, like I said, we change the voltage uh, across that cell membrane. All right? The cell membrane 
also has in it potassium gates that will specifically let potassium in. And so once the voltage changes as a result of the sodium coming in, the potassium gates open to let potassium out to try to neutralize that voltage change. Okay? Sodium rushes in. We've got a lot of plus charge coming in. We've got potassium gates. If we open the potassium gates, remember we've got more potassium inside than outside, so potassium wants to go out, and it rushes out. Okay? That causes the voltage, which has changed drastically from the sodium change, to now reset itself. Okay? That's what starts the process. Now I'm going to tell you in a second how we propagate that process, but it's important to understand how we start the process. Okay? Now, I'm going to pretend like we've finished our signaling. We haven't, okay? but I'm going to, need to let you know what happens next in the process. Once this voltage has been relatively equalized by the movement of the potassium ions out, the sodium and the potassium gates close. Okay? So no more movement of ions. And what happens is the sodium potassium ATPase takes over and starts pumping as it was doing before. It's pumping sodium out and it's pumping potassium in. It's reestablishing those initial conditions that we saw. Okay? So in a simple sense, that's what's happening. Sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out, gates close, sodium potassium ATPase restores initial conditions. And until the sodium potassium ATPase uh, pump can reestablish those initial conditions, that nerve cell can't do any more signaling. Okay? With me so far? Now, as I said, I sort of pretended like we finished the signaling process and everything's going on, but a nerve cell has more than one signal that allows it to move down it. Nerve cells can be very long, it can be several feet long in some cases. Okay? And so a signal has to make it from one end of the nerve cell all the way to the other end of the nerve cell. Now, getting that sodium in, that potassium out, was really great right at the end of the nerve cell. But if I had to wait for that sodium to move all the way along the whole length of the nerve cell and wait for the potassium to start leaving that whole length of the nerve cell, the grizzly bear that's chasing me okay, would eat me, my finger would burn up in the flame, my responses would be way too slow for what they need to be. So I don't, my nerve system is not set up so that I wait for that long process to occur. Instead, it uses a very interesting trick. Okay? The interesting trick that the nerve system use, that the nerve cells use is they have gates all along the nerve cell. So I described one at the very end, but it's one of many gates that are along the entire length of the nerve cell. You with me? So what happens? We see the rush in of sodium, we see the rush out of potassium. Okay? We see the closing of the gates. But meanwhile, this rush of sodium in, the rush of potassium out, has affected the very first gate away from the end. And these gates are voltage sensitive. So that signal that started here now causes the same thing to happen on the next gate, on the next gate, on the next gate, on the next gate. And it propagates along the entire length of the nerve cell. Now what's remarkable is, if you do it in these little sequential steps like I just described to you, instead of waiting for the entire nerve cell to drain, that this signal can be propagated in milliseconds. Okay? You can get a signal to get your finger out of that flame before significant damage is done, before you burn the finger off and go, oh, wow, look what I did. Ah, right? Okay? So. That is the way that a nerve signal is transmitted. Ultimately, that signal goes from the end of one nerve cell to the beginning of another. And I'll show you later how that is communicated from one nerve cell to the next nerve cell. It's a similar mechanism, actually. Okay, everybody understand that? Yeah, yeah, Megan. Is paralysis related to, related to signaling? No, it's not related to signaling, unfor maybe, maybe fortunately, I guess. Um, because what happens with paralysis is you're interrupting the message that's making it to 
uh, the brain. And so with paralysis, what you've got is a severing of some way so that the, it'd be like cutting the phone line so that you can get the, the signal to the place where the cut is, but then the, it, it can't go further. So that's what's happening with paralysis. Yes? Yeah, it's a good question. How does something like heat trigger a nerve cell to fire? There are a lot of mechanisms that are used. Um, I will actually talk about some of these mechanisms um, at the very end of the term. So let me save that for that. Um, I have a lecture that I give on um, uh, 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 pain and sensing, which is how heat comes through on taste, on vision, and on hearing. So let me, let me save the answer for that, Jay. Yes? So the people with paralysis, can they still have reflexes if it's severed above, like, Right. So the question is, where does the paralysis uh, come in? And, and what you said is right. You do have you do have sensations and reflexes beyond the point uh, where the severing occurred, and that's why you see people who may be par paralyzed from the waist down uh, versus, say, the neck down. And so it depends on where that that, that uh, severing has occurred. Yeah. To you mean like electrical shock? Uh -huh. Okay, so her question, oh, I think I know what your question is. So her question is, you've got a severe trauma, and when you have that severe trauma, uh, the concern is you may not respond to that trauma, and that does happen in some cases. How, why can that happen? Is that, is that sort of what you're, what you're saying? Okay, so um, what, I, I'll give you an example, all right? Um, how many people here work in labs? Okay. And how many people use mercaptoethanol in labs? Okay, what does it smell like? It smells sulfury. It smells like rotten eggs. Okay, it's got a foul smell. What you discover in working with it in the lab for a time is that you lose after you've been around it for say an hour or so. You don't smell it anymore. And what happens is your brain has a filter built into it to keep you from signaling, 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 signaling constantly and distracting you so that you don't, um, uh, in other words, it lets you go on and do other things. That works great if you're working with mercaptoethanol and you're not, you don't be dri dri driven crazy by the smell all the time, but it doesn't work very well if you have something that, oh my God, I've got to respond to this and my system has, has essentially shut down. But that's the same system as doing that. There's a filtering mechanism in your brain that basically recognizes stuff as being noise and just shuts it off. It doesn't work for everything. Chronic pain, for one. So, okay. Instructor pain. It's, it's always going to be there. Okay. Oh man, he's killing me, right? Okay. That's a different. That's you know, you've heard of the sixth sense. You know, it's kind of a sixth sense, is what it is. So you guys have a sixth sense. Okay, bad joke. So that's how nerve signals get uh, transmitted. All right. Now, there are things known as neurotoxins. You've heard of neurotoxins. There's a lot of neurotoxins that are out there. And neurotoxins are nasty things. Because what neurotoxins um, can do is they can basically kill nerve cells. Here's um, a neurotoxin known as tetrodotoxin. It comes from a, a fish known as the puffer fish that is a delicacy in Japan. The puffer fish is uh, a, 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 a very um, popular fish uh, in Japanese culture. And there are certain organs that have this tetrodotoxin in them that if you eat them, they will nail you, basically. Because what they do is they block your sodium channels. So they stop neural transmission. They can kill a nerve cell. The consequences can lead ultimately to death, or they can have severe nerve damage, etc. And every year, there are people who eat puffer fish um, that haven't been prepared properly who get neurotoxin from it. Okay? Not a good thing. So uh, neurotoxins cause problems. There are some that bind to sodium. There are some that bind uh, to the sodium channels. There are some that bind to the potassium channels. And I'm realizing as I'm saying channels, I call them gates. Channels and gates, same thing. Sodium channel, sodium gate. Okay? These cause, uh, not, not surprisingly, enormous problems. Okay. And there are other ones that are out there. One of the things that happens uh, when you hear of things like red tide and why they shut down um, some of the um, uh, shellfish um, uh, uh, harvesting off the coast 
is that when red tide or something comes in, there's a, there's a species of uh, microorganism that can that is found in the uh, shellfish that are being harvested that time, and they produce uh, neurotoxins, and so they stop people from actually harvesting them at that time for fear of poisoning a whole bunch of people, which is not considered a good move for your business if, you're, if that's what you're doing. Okay. Uh, now, let's say a little bit of word of, yes, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Laurie. Good question. Can you develop anti-venom that would pull them out of the channel? You know, I honestly don't know. I would think that you would be able to do that, like a like a snake venom, anti-toxin, uh, anti-venom. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good, very good question. Uh, speaking of good questions, I, I, that reminds me of something else I wanted to say. I had I've had several really good questions, both in this class and also by email. I had somebody ask me a really good question the other day about uh, I talked about reactive oxygen species and how. Uh, mitochondria get damaged over time by the, their exposure to oxygen and so forth. And the question was, uh, do chloroplasts have the same problem? Because chloroplasts actually, in photosynthesis, run an electron transport system. Um, as I told the student, I don't know the answer to the question. I had my guesses and so forth about it, but it's a very good question. And this class has been really good about that. And so I was thinking of ways that I might encourage that. And I'm thinking of setting up maybe an hour session a week that if you'd like to come and ask questions or expand your mind and think about possibilities of things you can do with biochemistry or something like that, um, I would be very happy to um, be available for that. Would that be of interest to many people in here? Okay. Uh, so I'll look for a room. I'm thinking probably the best time for me would be Wednesday afternoons, about four or so. Um, so um, I'll make an announcement of that if you're interested. There's all kinds of fun things that we can think about and talk about like that. And if you, you just want to come and have questions, that's fun too. I mean, that's fi fine too. Um, Fun, fine, I can't talk. So I'll think about that for later. Okay. Um, I want to turn our attention to the gates and the channels. Okay. The gates and the channels are really interesting and probably um, um, you haven't given them much thought so far. So now I'm going to give you some thought about them. The reason that they're interesting is, is first of all, they're fairly selective for only allowing specific things through them. They're fairly selective for that. Okay. I described for a nerve cell, which is true for virtually, uh, well, for other cells as well, but for a nerve cell, I've uh, described a sodium channel and a potassium channel, or a sodium gate and a potassium gate. Okay? And I said the sodium gate pretty much only let sodium through, and the potassium gate pretty much only let potassium through. And you accept that at face value, which is fine. You haven't had much chance to think about it. But if you think back to your freshman chemistry, there's a problem. Potassium has a wider radius or wider diameter than does sodium. So how do you have a gate like the potassium channel, which it has to be big enough to let potassium through, not let a smaller ion like sodium through? How do you do that? Okay. That's a really cool problem. It's a really cool question. All right. So the potassium gate has to be big enough to let a potassium through, but it doesn't let the smaller sodium ion through. Now, that tells us, first of all, that the controlling mechanism is not size, at least in the case of the potassium gate. Size is not the controlling mechanism. It's not the guard. In the case of the sodium gate, size is a great way to, to, uh, to guard the fort because potassium is big enough, it can't make it through the sodium gate. Make sense? There is the potassium ions bigger. If the sodium gate is small enough, potassium can't make it through, but sodium could make it through. So for the sodium gate, size is a good exclusion mechanism. For the potassium gate, that doesn't work. And so I want to explain to you, and I'll be honest, it gets a little techy, but I want to explain to you how it is that the potassium gate is able to exclude smaller ions like the sodium ion. Okay, So here's the actual gate. And uh, as you can see, it has a little uh, chamber there. It's about three angstroms wide. So it's not very wide, but it's wide enough to let a, sodium, uh, wide enough to let a potassium in. Okay. 
the selectivity that we see as these guys go through is that the, um, there are amino acid side chains that are positioned along the way that can do interactions with the potassium dimensions better than they can do interactions with the sodium dimensions. Okay? So you can imagine the potassium fits just right, right? Just right. The sodium is smaller, and so there's some flexibility. We can imagine that, right? That's the starting point. So sodium is smaller. It doesn't fit just right. You've put on a glove that's a little bit too big. You know that, right? So you've got a smaller, your hand's too small for the glove. That's what you're going to feel. All right. Now, how is the exclusion actually done? Well, let me tell you what the answer is, and then I'll show you how it's done. The answer is that the exclusion is done by energy barriers. Energy barriers. Okay? It turns out that it takes more energy for a sodium to make it through than it does for a potassium to make it through. Okay? Now, there's no external energy like ATP or anything like that. The only energy is the energy of diffusion. Okay? But that energy of diffusion has some considerations, and it turns out it takes more to get sodium through than potassium. So now I'm going to show you how that happens. Okay. Here's potassium. Potassium is floating around in the, uh, outside the cell looks like this. Here's a positive ion. This positive ion is surrounded by water molecules because, again, we're in an aqueous environment. And these water molecules arrange themselves so that the negatively charged oxygen is attracted towards the positively charged potassium. And they form a shell around that potassium ion. That shell is big enough that it won't make it through that chamber. These waters have to be stripped off in order for potassium to make it through. So the stripping off of these waters is happening as it's passing through the channel. With me? That takes energy. It's called desolvation energy. There's a certain amount of energy that it takes to pull those waters off so that potassium can go sliding through that channel. As this guy is passing through the channel, there are water molecules positioned to now come back and reattach itself to the potassium ion. And they're positioned just right. The glove fits. Okay? This gives energy to this guy as it's making through. And what we discover is that for potassium, as it moves through, the potassium ion is actually gaining energy. Here's how much we put in. Here's how much we get out. So this is energetically favorable for the potassium ion to pass through this chamber because we're getting more energy out as it passes through than it took to pull the waters off as it was entering. It turns out that's not the case for sodium. With sodium, here's the amount of energy. Here's sodium. It's got, it's got, because it's got different dimensions, it's got a different arrangement of waters around it. Okay? It takes a certain amount of energy, and you can see a pretty good amount of energy to strip those waters off as it's passing through. But look at how little energy it recovers as it's passing through that chamber. As the waters are coming back on, that difference is not fully made up. You might wonder why that's the case. The glove's too big. The hand is wiggling around. The more the hand has to wiggle around, the harder it is to position or get itself properly aligned with the right water molecule. The glove fits for the potassium. The glove does not fit. It's too big for the sodium. And so sodium is bouncing around. It will eventually make it through. It will eventually make it through. Okay? But the rate with which it makes itself through is about 1 one-hundredth that of the potassium. Potassium is 100 times faster. The reason? This energy difference. That's why it is not favorable for the smaller sodium ion to make it through the larger potassium channel. It's an amazing trick. Um, we actually had on this campus a couple of years ago the Nobel laureate who discovered this. And he gave a talk on this process. And it's absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, for those of you, I'll just say this briefly, who are pre-med. How many pre-meds in here? Okay. So he came and he talked to pre-meds. And the reason he talked to pre-meds was he's an MD. And he was an MD who came through, went all the way to medical school, went all the way through medical school, and he got out and says, you know, I wished I'd done research. True story. And he completely um, stopped practicing medicine and got himself uh, a bit of training, got himself a laboratory, and the next thing you knew, he won the Nobel Prize. So it's an example about how you can change your interests in life. And I'm not saying that to get anybody to change their interests in life, okay? But it's an example about how things, uh, the system is flexible enough that you can make changes, and you should always try to listen to that inner voice as you're going through deciding what it is you want to do in your career. He said that when he went to his wife after four years of medical school and residency and all the other things, and he was actually a practicing physician, and he told his wife, I don't think I want to be a physician, okay? The natural reaction one might expect would be, you are nuts, right? And she looked at him and she said, okay, honey, what would you like to do? True story. Wow, pretty amazing. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, question. Say again? Yeah. So it turns out that the, 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 the gain is actually, again, realized as a result of geometry. And the geometric gain is that these guys are energetic. There is an energy gained in regaining these water, water ions that are on there. And it's set up in that chamber so nicely that they gain it in the right way that the energy is maximized. Whereas, and, I, and I'm, I'm, this is a whole biophysics course that it would take to answer your question in essence. But it is a geometric consideration. That's why that larger thing works, and the, the, the bigger glove that doesn't fit doesn't do it. But that, that's a, a simple answer. It's not what you wanted, I think, in terms of complete answer, yeah, but again. I'm trying to figure out where the initial investment comes from. To... The initial investment actually comes from Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is the random motion that things have um, in solution, and that Brownian motion provides that impetus if without Brownian motion you don't have the energy necessary to strip that water, that water off. Without that, it doesn't work. So you have to have the Brownian motion that, that sets the whole thing going. But you, don't, but you actually end up realizing more than the energy of the Brownian motion as it passes through that chamber. I like to think about it, if you want to, as a, uh, a, a cocked gun, right? And so you're literally firing a gun as it's going through. When you fire that gun, you do realize more energy as things are happening, as that bullet is, is passing. So that's maybe a dumb analogy, but that's, that's the best I can come up with. Yes, Jen? So after you put a potassium ion through, yeah. Store the waters that it's yep. After you pass the so an ion through, you have to restore everything. That's right. So does that make it like a slower channel than a sodium channel? Uh, does that make it a slower channel than a sodium channel? I don't know. I suspect it would be uh, for a couple of reasons. One being possibly that, but also remember that as I said, sodium can make it through about one one hundredth, and so sodium can actually plug this thing up and slow it down by itself. So I'll show you. Let me show you a figure I have for that. Also, I was just getting ready to do that. Um, so I would suspect that, yes, it would be a slower channel. Uh, I don't know that de definitively, though. Um, and if you look here, okay, so this is uh, showing you what happens uh, when the system starts getting plugged up. Okay, so these guys, maybe this might be a sodium or something, and it's, it's sort of uh, slowing the process down. Things trying to enter don't make it back in, and so they have to wait until this process, uh, whatever's in that chamber, goes along and, and, and allows the next one to come through. So yeah, it, it, it could be slower in that sense. Yeah, a lot of questions, yeah. Well, as you can see here, this, this depicts about three that are making it through, and that's just, it's just simply a schematic. It's not a, a single one at a time, no. They will, you will have more than one at a time going through. The rates with which they pass is phenomenal. When you look at the number of ions that pass through uh, a membrane over time. It's, it's mind-boggling. But remember that the, at, at the molecular level, the numbers of molecules that we have are pretty mind-boggling as well. They don't relate, they don't translate real well to our macroscopic world. It's kind of like we talked about um, um, the um, um, carboxylase last time. Okay? The carboxylase that catalyzed uh, a million molecules of product per molecule of reactant per second. Okay? Those numbers are hard to fathom in this world that we live in here. 
Maybe a lot of things I have to say are hard to fathom in this world that we live in here. <clears throat> I can blame the smallness of the system. Okay. All right. Um, as I said, there are a variety of, of mechanisms. Jenny asked how uh, it was that uh, you have uh, pain or things can be sensed. Um, and there's different systems, different gating systems. Come on. There's different, gating, different arrangements of gating system. Here's a gating system that responds pretty much solely on the basis of voltage. As voltage changes, this opens and closes. Uh, there are others that are involving what are called balls and chains. We actually have things that physically block them according to uh, the circumstances that are there. And uh, there's a, a, quite a variety of these. Uh, there's a very interesting one that's in your ears uh, that, as I said, we'll talk about at the end of the year, end of the year where actually there's a physical movement of uh, an ear hair that allows the movement of ions in and out. And that's uh, kind of cool, too. OK, let's think about what happens in transmitting information from one nerve cell to the next. So you, I hope now understand how that signal gets propagated from one end of a nerve cell to the other end of a nerve cell. But nerve cells don't, at least all nerve cells, don't all connect directly to the brain. So we have to have uh, something that connects nerve cell to nerve cell. How does information make it from one to the other? And one of the ways, it, well, the way it makes it from one nerve cell to the other is by using small molecules that are called neurotransmitters. Okay. There are quite a variety of small molecules that are used as neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is a very common one. And the type of neurotransmitter depends upon the type of nerve cell. And your brain has a whole bunch of different neurotransmitters that it uses uh, within the brain for uh, communicating information. But acetylcholine is one. You don't need to worry about the structure uh, again, but you should know acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. Now, as nerve cells get their signal, and they pass that signal all the way to their end, what we see is something that looks like this. Here is the end of one nerve cell. Here's the beginning of another one. We've got a signal that started at the top. It moved itself all the way down to here. And when it gets to the end of the nerve cell, what we discover is that there are little structures, little bubbles, if you want to think about them that way, full of neurotransmitter. They're full of neurotransmitter. They're called synaptic vesicles. And if this were a nerve cell that used acetylcholine, the orange would be the acetylcholine. When the signal makes its way down, the signal causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the outer membrane. We see the fusing that has happened here. Okay. This allows the neurotransmitter that's inside to now be leaked out. And it crosses what's called the synaptic cleft. Synaptic cleft is simply the space between the individual nerve cells. This guy doesn't have to diffuse very far, as you can see. That signal goes very almost instantaneously to the next nerve cell. And the neurotransmitter causes the sodium gates to open, and then the potassium gates to open, and then that same process that we saw up here. So now the signal is propagated from one nerve cell to the next cell thanks to the neurotransmitters. So now we see the movement of sodium ions in, the movement of potassium ions out, and this guy starts doing the same thing the other one did. OK. Now this is a good point for me to talk about a very, some very interesting things relating to things like uh, addiction. Okay. Cocaine addiction, in particular, is very interesting uh, in this respect. So imagine, if you will, that I'm communicating information in my brain. And in our brain, we have all kinds of areas that respond to and give us sensations of various things. So one of the things that uh, cocaine does is it stimulates the uh, pleasure center of your brain. Okay? And the pleasure center of your brain has connections just like this guy does right here. And so what cocaine does is it, elong it, 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 it um, stimulates and it lengthens the pleasure sensation. So normally you might feel good about something and it wouldn't last. With cocaine, it lasts longer. And this is one of the reasons that it becomes addicting to people. They, they do things to elongate or keep that, that pleasurable sensation for a longer period of time. At the molecular level, 
it's interesting what it does. Okay? So what happens here is I've shown you that these neurotransmitters can bind over here and start the process, but I haven't told you what happens to the neurotransmitter itself. Okay? I haven't told you what happens to the neurotransmitter itself. It turns out that in a normal nerve cell, there is a recycling mechanism that takes back the neurotransmitter back into the original nerve cell so it can be used again. Okay? So in the absence of, 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 of some, something that interferes with that process, the neurotransmitter gets recycled, the sensation goes away, you feel good, but you don't feel ecstatic forever. Okay? Cocaine interferes with the reuptake. It interferes with the reuptake of the neurotransmitter. So if this neurotransmitter is stimulating this guy over down here to make you feel good, and it can't, this guy can't take up the original neurotransmitter, that neurotransmitter is going to sit here, it's going to keep stimulating this guy and stimulating and stimulating, and that pleasurable sensation is, is lengthened. Okay, make sense? Clear as mud? Quit saying that. God, <laughs> just quit it, Ahern. Yes? So is cocaine then like a bad SSRI drug? Like a serotonin reuptake? It, uh, yes, yes. So it, I, but it's like the same mechanism as Prozac and some of those other mm -hmm. drugs? Yep, yep, oh. same mechanism as other drugs used. This guy is a particularly nasty one in that respect. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, Lori. So can this work in the opposite? Can you have a, a elongated pleasure sensation, but also an elongated bad sensation, which would be a bad trip? Um, I would imagine when you hear about drugs that cause bad trips, uh, that probably is the case, but I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, Lori. I, 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 I was alive in the 60s, okay, so, you know. <laughs> you know? I've been out there, but I haven't done it at a scientific investigative level, so I can't tell you. I don't know. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry? The re yeah, the reuptake actually occurs. Um, that's a good question. I should look that up. But my recollection is it sort of remakes something like a vesicle and then re uh, binds to the nerve cell and is retaken up. Uh, I think that's the, the case, but I don't recall that off the top of my head. Um, there's uh, what cocaine does, if I recall correctly, is it binds to an enzyme that helps with that reencapsulization. So it inhibits the enzyme, and the reencapsulization doesn't happen, and so the neurotransmitter stays back out. I believe that's what, what happens with that. Yes, sir. What causes the addiction? The addiction is the fact that the, you you seek to extend that that pleasurable feeling. The pleasurable feeling is very pleasurable, and that's that's what it is. Yeah. It's very addicting, and many pleasurable things. Um, end up being, you know, uh, addicting just for that that very reason. Yes. Um, so does the Yeah. Uh, question is, does the neurotransmitter bind directly to the sodium channel? No, it does not. It binds to other things that stimulate the sodium channel uh, to open. Yep. Yes. Right. Does some, regulate, does some addiction come from upregulation of acetylcholine receptors? My suspicion is that um, it very well could. In fact, I believe you're, in fact, there are uh, mechanisms where that's exactly the, 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 the case. And I don't know if it's acetylcholine specifically, but upregulation of receptors uh, to make them much more sensitive and able to signal uh, does happen. Because what, uh, one of the things that occurs with that is, um, oh, God. Now, this is, it's embarrassing thinking off the top of your head when you're standing in front of 300 people. Uh, but uh, there is a, um, the phenomenon that, that you're describing does occur and it, it, um, it makes it very difficult to turn that signal off because when you've got an awful lot of receptors, they're fishing for anything and they start a signaling process and bang, you're off and running. So that's, that's one physical way in which that can happen. Like nicotine. nicotine, yeah, yeah. In fact, nicotine is the example, yeah. Okay. Good questions. Maybe you guys deserve a joke instead of just jumping into something new. Okay. All right. So, and by the way, people have been sending me jokes too. This is really good. Okay. So, <laughs> keep those jokes coming. I try to give things that I think you haven't heard. Okay. So, 
you know how they tell jokes and you tell jokes to make fun of a certain group of people. So they used to do it with ethnics, or they did it with women, or they did it with men, or blondes, or whatever. And so I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to pick on a certain group. Well, there's certain groups of people we don't mind picking on, okay? So I'm going to pick on deans, okay? So this, this joke is about deans, all right? You know, like the dean of the college and so forth. Okay, so you've got deans. All right, so there's these two deans, and they're sitting on an airplane, okay? This is your pilot speaking. We will be flying. Welcome to Transamerica Airlines, and we're flying from um, New York to Los Angeles, and... Um, it's a red-eye flight, so uh, we expect to be uh, in Los Angeles uh, uh, probably around 1 a.m. Okay, this is fine, you know, so they take off and they're flying along. And about an hour later, there's this boop. And the uh, pilot comes down and goes, this is your pilot speaking. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've had a little uh, mechanical problem. We have uh, one of our engines has given out. Uh, but this is a four-engine plane, uh, so we have three engines left. Uh, we will be uh, expected, the uh, only thing that's going to happen will be a little later arriving in Los Angeles. We should be arriving about 2 a.m. Eh, it's okay, not a big deal. I go back to sleep, you know. Pretty soon, bump. Okay. Uh, this is your pilot speaking again. Uh, can't believe this, but we had a second engine go out. Uh, but again, we have two good engines. We expect to be arriving in Los Angeles about 3 a.m. Uh, thank you. Go back to sleep. Bump. <laughs> You knew that was coming, right? Uh, wow, this is your pilot speaking again. Uh, we've lost number three engine there. Uh, we still have one engine. I expect to be arriving in uh, Los Angeles about uh, 4 a.m. One dean looks at the other dean and says, you know, if that last engine goes out, we're going to be flying all night. <laughs> you don't like that one that much. <laughs> Even if I'm making fun of deans. Okay, all right. All right, that's what I want to say there. Um, let's see. Let's turn our attention <laughs> briefly to mitochondria again. Okay? Back to mitochondria. Now, you've learned about membranes. You've learned about the issues of moving things across the membrane. And you've seen some of the ways in which that can happen. The reason I talk about that before I come back and talk about mitochondria is so that you will uh, understand that some of these mechanisms that we talked about for other transport systems are very, very important in mitochondria. Without some of the transport pumps that I'll be talking about, okay, specifically a proton pump, without that proton pump, we don't have any way of getting 99% of our energy. Okay? So if we disrupt the pumping system in mitochondria, we're in deep doo-doo. I showed you earlier the mitochondria. You saw a picture that looked like that. This is a mitochondrion in the cell. It has an outer membrane and it has an inner membrane. I said the inner membrane is the most important. The inner membrane is impermeable to everything except those same four molecules we saw before. Water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and oxygen. Though they flow through there freely. Other things don't. Protons do not flow through there freely. That's, in, that's essential for understanding how mitochondria work. The mitochondria have these infoldings, and these infoldings are part of the inner membrane. You see them going in and out and in and out. And what they do, these infoldings do, is they give a lot of surface area to the inner membrane. More surface area means more places for proteins to be and more places for things to happen. These infoldings are called cristae, C-R-I-S-T-A-E, cristae. The matrix, of course, is the soup, which is the liquid that I compared to the cytoplasm, and it's found all the way in the middle of all this other stuff. Okay. Now, um, that shows it a little better. Now we can see that these cristae are, are uh, contiguous with the inner membrane, and that's where all that um, action occurs. And what we're going to be talking about um, on Friday and also on Monday are processes that are schematically shown here. Okay? What we're going to see is that there's a movement of electrons that occurs, and that movement of electron occurs through a series of complexes that are located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
the movement of the electrons through these complexes cause protons to be pumped out of the matrix. Okay? There's one thing you take away from this, this is it. Movement of electrons causes protons to be kicked out of the matrix. This causes protons to be higher outside than inside. That higher concentration of protons makes them want to come in, and the way that they come in is through another complex, and when they come in through that other complex, they cause this other complex to spin and make ATP. This is like a little turbine. It's a little molecular turbine, and it actually is just that. I'll show you a figure probably on Monday for that. Okay, that's a good stopping point. I will see you guys on Friday. similarity there, yes. Yes, so it's pretty much the same. So the main difference in the nervous systems are where they're connecting the brain and so forth, and that's where the more complex complexity yeah. is. But the basic transmission, as far as I know, is exactly the same. Hey there. Hi. Yeah. Hi.